just wanted to begin by saying that since, um, at least my own view, it would be something odd about, at a symposium on the theme of childhood at the present moment, not to mention the capacious moral sympathies of the current president of the United States, that I read this morning that Time magazine has put Donald Trump on the front cover uh, along with a picture of a sobbing child. Sobbing, as you may have already noticed, figures in my title, and I will be coming to that shortly. It's absolutely front and center of what I essentially want to say to you today about Proust on the theme of childhood. But uh, let me begin elsewhere, somewhere very different with a sentence, as I'm afraid this is typically where professors begin, who is the wag who once said that people read books and professors read sentences. But it is a very remarkable sentence late in Proust's novel, A la recherche du temps perdu, where the narrator speaks of a place in the mind where children and the dead uh, get together as souls returning from a lost past, a long gone past. And the sentence I will now read, the sentence runs as follows. When we have passed a certain age, the soul of the child we were and the souls of the dead from which we have sprung uh, come to lavish on us their riches and their spells. Now, that sentence, that is, reflects a version of what we can call vintage Proust. And it is the sort of thing that explains, especially the emphasis on ghosts and magic, that explains why we often think of Proust as one of the great literary artists, modern literary artists, excuse me, uh, of childhood. Or more exactly, uh, of or the work of memory uh, in returning to childhood. Um, now, his immense novel is precisely that. It begins in childhood, uh, returns to it, dwells there for the better part of 400 pages or so, and several thousand pages later, in the closing moments of the last volume, uh, 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 it was where the, narrator, where the narrator embraces his future as the writer of the book that we have just read. Um, it, there it goes back once again to boyhood one last time and specifically to the sound of the garden gate bell uh, which would announce the regular evening visits of their Combray neighbor, uh, Charles Swann. And this concluding evocation marks the one very important dimension of the Proustian work. It marks the importantly secular, uh, I'm so sorry, circular shape of Proust's book, a circle in which the past of childhood and the present discovery of the artistic vocation are indissolubly joined. Now, amongst many other things, in that, the making of that connection between childhood and art, we find an echo of an idea that takes root at the beginning of European Romanticism. The idea that through art we can remake contact with the childlike state that modern man, above all modern man, has been separated from, principally by the processes uh, that compel compliance with the modern regimes of instrumental rationality. Now, these were some of the arguments that uh, of the great German cultural philosopher, Friedrich Schiller, who long before Marx, uh, in his great work, Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Mankind, uh, diagnosed an impoverishment of the spirit arising from the specialization, the specializing of function and faculty uh, uh, under the domination of instrumental reason. Schiller here was close to another figure previously mentioned by Simon, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who, who in his work Emile, uh, his major work on childhood and the disciplining regimes of socialization, uh, where Rousseau wrote of our relation to childhood prior, prior to the influence of these regimes as follows, I quote, who has not sometimes regretted that age when laughter was ever on the lips and when the heart 
was ever at peace. Schiller's dream in the letters of the, on the aesthetic education of mankind and indeed elsewhere, a dream that was shared by many of his contemporaries, was of a recovery of those lost human resources of alleged natural being and unreflecting spontaneity. This is what Schiller famously wrote. They, meaning children, they are what we once were and what we ought to become again. Now, the question against that background, sketchily outlined background, the question that for the purposes of our gathering that I want to bring into the foreground is whether Proust uh, can, in fact, plausibly be seen as a continuation and extension of that legacy of Romanticism. It may come as no surprise if I say the answer is both yes and no, but may surprise if, uh, and here I'm be talking somewhat against the grain of certain remarks of Alan's yesterday afternoon, early evening, uh, it may surprise if I immediately go on to add that it is altogether more no than yes. Now that is one way, of course, of stating an aim, uh, if not actually to upset, then certainly to somewhat disarrange or rearrange a familiar version of the Proustian apple cart. And one reason uh, for this has to do with the plain fact that the cart does not stop in Combray. Entrancing though it is, Combray, the centerpiece of volume one, is not the whole of the Recherche, although it is often only what for what uh, many readers of Proust know. It's a very common experience to read volume one and stop. Um, and that's reflected in the sales figures, uh, just easily mappable statistically. It is very common for readers to stop at that point and in stopping at that point, form and retain a highly misleading version or view of what Proust's novel is also all about. Look, while one of the structural shapes of the novel, as I've just intimated, is that of a circle, various loops and returns of recollection across the arc of time, uh, it is also a linear novel, that unfurling a trajectory that runs from early childhood through to somewhere indeterminate in later middle age, entirely consonant with the form of the traditional European Bildungsroman. And as we head out of Combray, as we must, if we persist in reading through, uh, into the succeeding six volumes, not only narratively speaking is childhood left behind, we also find ourselves moving deeper and deeper into a world that is essentially childless. For all its vastness, including its vast cast of characters, um, there are hardly any children in Proust's novel. Alongside, for example, two 19th century novelists who also went in for vastness and whom Proust greatly admired, Dickens and Tolstoy, Proust's fictional world is not notably child-friendly. The boy narrator appears to have no siblings and his only playmate, also the only other child in the novel who has given any narrative substance at all is Gilbert in the first volume, a friendship which, however, unfolds on the cusp of puberty, uh, the edge of the adolescent sexual curiosity that will inform the sojourns in Balbec that in the succeeding uh, volumes, and crucially, of course, the encounters with the enthralling band of young girls in flower. But beyond that, this point, apart from a few fleeting mentions, children are conspicuous in Proust's novel by their absence. Now, there are several reasons for this. I don't have time to go into the reasons in any detail, but it's partly a reflection. This is partly a reflection of a profound sense of sterility at the heart of the historical and social world that Proust describes, a wasteland uh, in turn related to Proust's view, his view of adult sexuality as essentially rapacious and cruel. Uh, something straight out of the Augustinian tradition. 
important priest. The sexual relation is rarely life-giving or life-sustaining and expresses more the relation of hunter and hunted uh, as a game of capture and evasion that will come to a head in the narrator Albertine relationship later in the book. But what if we choose to remain, as indeed so many do remain, exclusively in the Combray world of the first volume, with precisely its riches and its spells? This is the dimension, uh, sorry, it is this, this is, sorry, this is the dimension of Combray above all lived and recalled in the most famous, uh, certainly the most widely quoted, episode of the entire novel. The episode no one can bypass, although I sometimes wish we could. The moment when, as if by magic, worlds of sensation and impression, both remembered and re-experienced, are conjured from the taste of a pastry dipped in a cup of lime blossom tea, uh, to provide a foundation stone for the entire architecture of the novel. Now, the particular feature of this that I myself would want to highlight here is the cup as a sort of cornucopia, brimming with sensorial memory that is lodged deep in the bodily unconscious with the boundaries between one kind of sensory experience and another proved to be porous and interactive. Now, there's a technical name for this in the trade. It's in both psychology and aesthetics. Uh, it's called synesthesia. That is to say, the power of one order of sensation to suggest or provoke another. This was also a major preoccupation of the Romantics and their immediate successors. Uh, in France, most crucially in Baudelaire, who is never very far away, when it is a matter of discussing the Proustian, the Proustian aesthetic. It was also to become in Proust time a central theme of devel developmental psychology and in some versions of psychoanalysis. The fluidities, the sensorial fluidities that Proust here described seen as what typically characterizes the infant state, what we are born with and which then departs us as part of the developmental processes of specialization of function and faculty, and before the body becomes what later in his novel Proust memorably describes as, a, I quote, our mortal enemy. Now, this rhapsodic overflowing of the compartmentalizing adult mind by the primitive life of physical sensation and bodily memory is for many, I've already emphasized this point, I re-emphasize it, is for many the quintessential Proust, tantamount indeed to hallowed ground, what the narrator himself describes as the mental soil, the sol mental of his life and of the book that we are reading. Others, however, including myself, have maintained that it is soil that risks exhaustion from over-cultivation with the wrong fertilizer, namely a form of sentimentality uh, of the kind favored by a certain class of Proustians in desperate need of the sugar rush of swooning epiphanies. In any case, whatever one's views of the powers of Madeleine, this is by no means the whole of Combray. Along with the rhapsodic, there is also the traumatic. And it's a term I use here, not in the trivializing sense of a great deal of contemporary usage, but in its original associations, famously via Freud, of course, with the principle of intermittence, a hugely important theme, important Proustian experience, namely that which designates the delayed effect of something surging back into consciousness after having been repressed and banished from memory. In this context, we have not the surges of joyful, spontaneous recollection typified by the example of the Madeleine, but rather those of a wounding, a wounding of the child psyche so deeply inflicted as to be incurable. And here I refer 
to the other central episode of Combray, the Combray volume, the drama of neediness, fear, and theoretical, and threatened loss, I'm sorry, that accompanies the episode of the mother's goodnight kiss, initially refused, hysterically entreated, and finally, though reluctantly, given. It is the source, this is the source of the sobbing alluded to in my title, the sobs that as everything else leaves and dies, never leave, and which are summarized, again unforgettably, in a passage from the first volume, also concerned with bells, though not the happily tinking bells of the garden gate of childhood. Here it is. The sobs that had never really stopped, and it is only because life is now becoming quieter around me that I can hear them again. Like those covenant bells covered so well by the clamor of the town during the day that one would think that they had ceased altogether, but which begin sounding again in the silence of the evening. Maman, as the narrator calls her and as I shall refer to her, uh, the English translation as Mama gives snotty-nosed hostages to fortune that are basically too numerous to mention. Maman is absolutely dead center of the childhood world in Proust, in both the fiction and his own life. A questionnaire of the time inquired of several well-known persons what would make them most unhappy. One response was vintage Belle Epoque, separation from cigars. Proust's was, I quote, being separated from Maman. And when the definitive separation came in 1905, he wrote to his very close friend, Anna de Noailles, the writer uh, Anna de Noailles, quote, she takes away my life with her, and then more elaborately to the writer Maurice Barrez, I quote again, our entire life together was only a period of training for the day when she would leave me, and this has been going on since my childhood when she would refuse 10 times to come back to say goodnight before going out for the evening. Now, I repeat the caveat Everybody repeats it because it's essential to do so regarding reductionist swaps of fiction and autobiography, but the parallels here between Proust's experience and what goes on in the first volume and indeed elsewhere of his novel are unmistak unmistakable, though with a peculiar, in the novel I mean, a peculiar twist performed inside a sort of narrative black hole. And this is what I now want to talk about in the time that remains, this black hole. And in that connection, I shall now fast forward to, where else, of course, to Venice. Fantasized as a dream destination from early on, the narrator finally gets to Venice late in the book, in the penultimate volume, La Fugitive, in the company of Maman, herself still grieving for the loss of her own mother. For Proust, Venice is, above all others, outside Combray, the place of pure magic. It's a word that he uses over and over again, is the word, French word, ébouissement. It's a place of pure dazzle, and it's above all instantiated, of course, by San Marco. And the key episode of the visit to San Marco is inside the basilica, the baptistry, uh, in the company of his mother. It is here, also here, that he perceives his mother as worn, aged, and stamped with mortality. This is the occasion of what, at least for me, others will speak for themselves, is the most moving sentence Proust ever wrote. Long, sinuous, and touchingly intimate. I quote it for you in its entirety. The time has now come for me when on remembering the, the, sorry, let me start that again. The time has now come for me when on remembering the baptistry, 
I cannot remain indifferent to the fact that there was by my side in this cool twilight a woman clothed in mourning whose respectful but enthusiastic fervor match that of the elderly woman who can be seen in Venice in Carpaccio's St. Ursula, and that nothing can ever again remove this red-cheeked, sad-eyed woman in her black veils from the softly lit sanctuary of St. Mark's, where I am certain to find her because I have reserved a place there in perpetuity alongside the mosaics for her, my mother. Now here we find not only the narrator's mother clothed, clothed in mourning, but also something else, an anticipation. Proust's novel is full of anticipations. The rhetorical figure for this is prolepsis. It's a deeply, systematically, recurringly proleptic work of art. And here we find an anticipation of a mourning, another mourning, ineluctably yet to come, namely the narrator's own for her death. This, however, brings me to the fictional black hole at the heart of the last volume. The last we see of Maman in the narrative is on the train back from Venice uh, with, to Paris with the narrator at the end of La Fugitive, towards the end of La Fugitive. In the final volume, Le Temps Retrouvé, she effectively disappears. Now, I'm not myself a great fan of word counts, certainly not of word counts masquerading as methodology under the fancy name of quantitative analysis uh, because now accessible in digital form. It may nevertheless be worth remembering that there are 210 instances of the term maman in the recherche, 71 in the first volume and a mere eight in the last seven of which refer to the narrator's mother and all as an object of childhood recollection. The last actual appearance, or rather mention, of Maman as a living presence in the narrative is when the narrator announces that he is off to the grand social gathering at the Guermantes, yet another one, it's the final one of the book, of course, while she has a tea appointment with a friend called Madame Sazerat. Now, this is a sort of parting of the ways in a minor key, but it also speaks, sotto voce, of another parting, and one altogether more definitive. From this point on, the narrator's mother, narratively speaking, simply ceases to exist. Now, that has to be one of the strangest evacuations or silences in the entire novel, indeed, in the history of modern fiction. And it is why I call it a fictional black hole, out of which a number of unanswerable questions pour. Has she died? Is this, if so, is this the one death of which the narrator simply cannot speak? Or is it, as one of Proust's biographers has put it, a view I do not myself share, but this, the view is there on the record, is it a placing of her in a kind of timeless zone out of reach where death cannot reach her? In other words, a fairy tale. So interpretations abound. I could list many more if there were time. But one thing is for sure. The passing reference to the tea appointment with Madame Cesarat followed by absence and silence, mark the moment of an exit. Her exit from the story, the story that begins with her, and it is, but more generally, an exit uh, in another set of senses, and it is with that, that stress on exit in the more general sense, that I will now wrap up rather rapidly. Maman's unrepresented and perhaps unrepresentable disappearance from Proust's novel is one way of marking the inevitable and definitive exit from the garden of Combray, the place where one cannot stay and which is in any case uh, intrinsically and incorrigibly flawed. In this, it resembles, of course, that other garden, the paradisal garden of Eden, 
versions of which, biblical and non-biblical, haunted the romantic imagination. But of which Proust himself observed, in perhaps his most famous maxim, the only true paradise is the paradise that we have lost. And what he meant by that is definitively lost. Now, in conclusion, I said earlier that one of my purposes was to disturb a received view of Proust by rearranging the Proustian apple cart. So let me finish with a few remarks about apples and orchards. A contest for the best description, I'm so sorry, a contest for the best Proustian description in the recherche is of course a mugs game, but I would certainly consider placing a bet on the stunning description of apple trees in the Côté du Guermont, as I quote, guardians of the memories of the golden age that accompany the earlier description of apple trees along with the hawthorn trees of the Mésiglise Way in Combray. Apple blossom was, however, what for Proust became a mortal enemy. Being anywhere near it would induce an attack of the psychosomatic illness that would lay him low for weeks and accompanied him through this, first encountered this when he was about 10 throughout the rest of his life. He could not go near apple blossom without that generating a serious medical crisis. Although philologically, there are in fact no apples in the original biblical Eden, the apple as poisoned fruit serves the allegory, as we all know, of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, the equivalent of which in Proust is the place where the sobs that never leave you are born and where in his great book you will also find a farewell to a literary tradition post Milton instantiated by the apples and the apple orchards of say Wordsworth through Rilke to Robert Frost. There I will stop. Chris, wow, thank you for a fantastic talk. Uh, I'm very aware of the limitations of my voluntary memory here, but I'm just thinking, I, I hadn't spotted the black hole, and it is an extraordinary thing you referred to. In many ways, he invested so much of his observation of death, of the mourning, of the guilt, the intermissions of the heart when you don't, you know, and so on, in his grandmother. He sort of used up everything on grandmother, but do you think that was a deliberate displacement? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry, Raymond, do you want me to elaborate on that? Um, I mean, the, sh the short and sweet answer is probably the best answer is just yes. Um, there's massive amounts of projection from the self-absenting mammal onto the ever-present um, and I spoke of uh, briefly, just en passant really, of the experience of the traumatic in Proust in relation to its original and true meaning of the reappearance of something repressed and then is triggered by a contingent something or other that has no intrinsic or necessary connection to the buried memory or the, the events associated with the buried memory and this is the moment when the grand mare dies this agonizing death. Um, it's the most agonizing death of the entire recherche. Um, and the narrator feels no grief. And then sometime later, he's in a hotel back in Balbec, and he bends down to do up his shoelaces 
Bingo. It takes him back in a flash to the time when his grandmother would bend down to do up his shoelaces, accompanying him on summer holidays in Balbec. Um, and it's like, uh, what's the metaphor I'm fumbling for? Not sluice is the wrong word, but it's just an opening, just an absolute outpouring of grief and sobbing. This is where the narrator narratively seriously sobs. So, yes. We're done?